any of the greats have said, like there's too much in the world to fix it all. Don't worry about that. Find the thing that you're drawn to. This is something I want to do and I'm going to jump in there. I don't have to be the guy that fixes the ocean. I don't have to be the guy that fixes the atmosphere. I can just find my own little thing. I can fix food in my own way on a small scale. A farm is just like my baby, literally like an infant. It needs all of its care really in the first seven years like kids do. And then mm. after that, because of the permaculture setup and the way we're working with our animals, it's really just going to be turnkey, you know, where everything is systematized and easy to work with. Give people some context. How many acres is it? 118 acres. And then I'm able to now dream into this 118 acre canvas effectively and see how do we want to paint this? What do we want to do? It's going to be in right relation with the land that'll enhance all ecosystems at once. Well, walk us around that painting a little bit. If we wanted to really make this high production, what do we do? So we put in a spiral food forest with 400 fruit and nut trees, about a thousand plants total. Piece by piece, we started adding the animals, a bunch of different chickens, sheep. And we've been feeding the cows by hand with alfalfa and just helping them to warm up. The relationship with the animals has been something that's just been awesome. One of the things that was most fascinating to me was just seeing the relationship between the sheep and the, and the guardian dogs. There's something so special going on here that you kids aren't going to learn in school. It's a reminder to you, the place to get back in touch with nature. If we're able to heal the land and, and bring it back to its full potential, what does that do for us? And really understanding the truth about what is the best form of agriculture. And then from there, going forward with that. smile dude i mean so much to say right and we'll i'm sure we'll cover a lot of it but whenever you've been on and you know actually i've been just finished a book which i don't know if I've read. you were telling me that you were uh you were working on it with ted's buddy yes and so then i had another person help me and then it, it's it's finally done it's been shit almost three years that it's taken, which it doesn't seem like it should have, but so much was changing. Uh, you you got to be careful too, because it's like, look, you can't make it current. And I wasn't, but there was just other stuff I wanted to share and change throughout it. But, you know, there are a few pivotal points in the book that, that I share. One's obviously Las Vegas, but, you know, a big part of Vegas was two days later meeting you. And then just, I mean, I've shared with this, you, with this with you before, I've shared it on the podcast, but just that portal that, you know, you kind of walked me through. Sometimes you shoved me through, <laughs> but I was willing and able and just how much flowed out of that. And um, whether it's, you know, my journey at large or even something like podcasting. Like you were, you know, by and large, my muse, like that's how I wanted to do it. You know, the conversations that you were having were really inspiring to me. The people you were having on, the questions you were asking really guided me in that's what I want to do. There's so many different ways to do podcasts. I want to get down to like what's behind whatever someone is, is known about publicly or like, who are they and why are they the way they are now versus maybe how they were in the past, right? The great unlearn, like, what does that journey look like? And dude, everybody's got that story. It's like, I've, I never feel like I'm at a loss for who to bring on the podcast. And so I'm just, I've, I've always had such gratitude for you for so many different things. But just as we sit here today, it's like, yeah, the podcast, I, I wouldn't, have, I don't think I would have done it had, certainly if we had not met, but if I hadn't been so inspired by the way you showed up and the questions you asked and the courage you showed, you know, asking those difficult questions that aren't for everybody, you know, it really gave me permission to go there and, you know, introduce me to guys like Del Bigtree, Mickey Willis. I mean, the list goes on and on, but those are a couple of guys where if you had told me previous to meeting them that these guys would be my brothers that I would have some of the best conversations I've ever had on the podcast with those guys. And I said, you're full of shit, you know, but that's just what's happened. So, I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but <laughs> I love you dude so much. And yeah. And, and, and 
in my guys are, you know, the guys that I've known, you know, prior to our relationship, they get to benefit from all of that too. So your, you know, your tentacles run far and wide throughout my, you know, my entire field. So yeah, just want to share my, my deep gratitude and love for you, brother. Thank you, brother. Feelings mutual. Absolutely. Yeah. So we get a lot to discuss today. I mean, I want to talk about parenting. What's parenting like for you? You know, I want to talk about <laughs> fit, fit for service. The farm is a, is a big topic. You know, you've, you've got this, this venture that you've been a part of and are, are really running. And I got to go out to the farm uh, in Lockhart with my son, Bowen, who absolutely adores you. Um, and it was really special to be out there and see what you're creating and excited to, um, continue to be a part of that. And, and, uh, yeah, it's really special. So I'm excited for you to be able to share that here as well. And then I'd love to, you know, just, you know, obviously you're doing the podcast. So what's inspiring you around that and, and whatever else comes up, but, you know, I mean, I guess let's just drop in with like, what's going on with you right now? Like what's most alive for you right now? Hmm. Well, <laughs> and we are going to talk about that incredible tattoo that you have. Fuck yeah, brother. That's a, I haven't talked about it yet on a podcast, so we could maybe briefly discuss the, the why I chose each thing or why it chose me. But um, yeah, the thing that's most alive is kind of a pressing combination of, of everything that I'm doing. It's not the podcast, believe it or not, because that there's, there's like a, that fire's always lit, you know, like it's always something that brings me joy no matter what. And, um, at this point, even if I get somebody who would maybe not be the best guest, like I'm going to fucking drill them until they become the best guest, you know, like we're going to find a way. You're going to be just curious. The, yeah, like, exactly. It, yeah, exactly. And we have some great dudes on. I had uh, one of the homies from Onalema, uh, the structured water stick. And you're like, all right. You Wait, structured water stick. I don't know about this. It's, uh, it's basically this structured water that comes from mother water. And you swirl it around in a glass. It's held by a crystal. And uh, with that, it structures the water in a way. And so I'd heard Dolph, one of the creators, who was originally um, one of like the founding programmers for early AI. Really fucking cool dude. And he was on Paul Check's podcast back in the day. And then uh, his, one of his co-founders, Mario, had been on a bunch of other podcasts more recently. And they wanted on. And I was like, fuck yeah, dude. I love your product. I got one the second. Uh, Dolph was on Paul's podcast. And so, I mean, I, I can taste a difference in the water and I feel different, but the amount of science that these guys have taken a deep dive into in between Dolph going on living 4d and Mario coming on my show is mind blowing. They found in humans, a 20% increase in ATP production. 20 I was like, wait a minute. That like, would be statistically <laughs> significant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like when we met, we're hanging with Lance and Tim. I mean, we're hanging with, with A-list guys. The difference between 2% is taking first place or eighth. Like yeah. you, might, you might not even, it's a 2% difference. Yeah. If you're dehydrated, that's a 2% difference. And you know, fucking haven't been an athlete. 2% feels like a lot. So 20, I was like, this is, this is, this could change the fucking world. This is crazy. And, and their new applications, exactly what I was thinking about. How does it affect plants? How does it affect the soil? How does it affect agriculture? And they're deep diving all that stuff. So I'm like, I got two hands raised. i let my farm be a guinea pig. We can water half the plants with it and half the plants not. Um, that's kind of what they're doing is these side-by-side -side comparison. And they're seeing inches different in growth rate. Uh, the microbiome of the soil is increasing. The amount of bacteria that become alive during that is able to capture tons of carbon, like almost immediately pumping back, obviously helping with whatever climate issues may or may not be there but putting the carbon back in the soil where it needs to be so it can feed all the plants, right? And so it's, it's really, really remarkable. But there's things like that. It's like the big unknown for me, where in podcasting, I don't, there's certain people I'm tracking where I'm like, dude, I want to have Martin Armstrong on, Armstrong Economics. He was on uh, The High Wire with Dale Big Tree. Fucking amazing. I'll send you the link. It's a must watch. And uh, maybe you can throw it in the show notes. It's a yeah. fucking really, really cool watch that, explains a lot of the shit that you and I have been privy to over the last few years in a very succinct way. 
and gives us ideas on how to manage that and work with it. So super important. But um, there's people like that where I'm like, I'd fucking got to get Dell back on after he was on your podcast. Those are just fucking phenomenal. I remember yeah. leaving you the voice note. Yeah. I was like, dude, best podcast ever. And um, Dell's certainly been doing a lot of great stuff. There's guys like Martin that I'm, you know, certain people that I want to hunt down and find and get on. And then there's people I don't know about like Mario, where it's like three or four months happens. I listen to somebody on one other person's podcast. They come on and just blow me the fuck out of the water. So I, I really appreciate that about podcasting that there's, there's so many curveballs and things that I'm not necessarily tracking. And then it happens and I'm just like floored, like, dude, this is next level. Like, this is a big deal. This is really cool. And I get to hear about it first, like sitting across a, uh, a computer screen or sitting across from somebody in a seat. It's pretty nuts. I'd say the most, the biggest thing, if that's not it, is some combination of the challenges of lack of sleep with where our kids are at parenting. They're both going through pretty big changes right now. Wolfie's two and a half going on three, Bear's seven and a half going on eight. Um, as Steiner teaches, you know, every seven year cycle is a big shift in kids. And so we can see that with him. Uh, we have the added bonus and challenge of homeschooling, right? So, um, and with the age difference, it's kind of a big deal. It's like if your kids are a couple years apart, as you know, mm -hmm. a little bit easier to sit them down and get them all doing the same thing. Um, so that's, that's been interesting, you know, with the lack of sleep, especially, especially with Tosh, but just getting really creative and figuring out different ways. And I'll dive into that. But um, some part of the parenting issues and challenges that are almost ever present. That's one thing Anna Hata taught me. She's like, you know, it doesn't end, right? Oh, it She's like, I'm an empty nester and I have a twin boy and a twin girl in college. And I'm trying to t help teach my son how to be a man in the current circumstances of the modern world <laughs> as a woman, right? And I was like- Yeah, even yeah. as a woman, as a man too, it's hard. But yeah, as a yeah. woman, I, 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 is an additional challenge. Absolutely. Um, so it doesn't end. I'm not looking for light at the end of the tunnel with that, but um, just always, you know, the ever present navigating of the waves there. I've uh, been d deep diving firearms, which has been awesome. And it's been something that's become like a really. I know I got a little bit shamed. I got a little bit, bit shamed up here. I have these two <laughs> gun safes that were here when we bought the place. They're and massive. I've, and I've converted them into storage for the podcast equipment, some other stuff. And Kyle's like, ugh. You, you, know, know, you gotta have a couple in there. Gotta have a couple. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple. But yeah, I've, I've been able to meet, you know, that's one thing that I, I noticed about Aubrey right from the moment I met him and is right when I met you. Same thing. We all have, and me to a slightly lesser degree, have, have the ability to meet fucking really awesome high end people and actually make deep connections with them that last. And that's not something everyone has, you know, it's, and it's not bragging about name dropping and this and that. It's just like that. Yeah, man, I've got so-and-so's phone number. He's a friend, whatever that is. But they're the thing about them outside of celebrity is that they're genuinely really fucking awesome people. You know, I totally forgot why I was bringing that up. Well, I, I'll say this on the gun stuff. Well, and, and what I would just add to that is I've thought about this a lot because I was talking to my kids about some different things and, they show up in their friend groups and if you hang out with dipshits, you're, you're going to be a dipshit. And the important thing is, you know, I only know this because I've been on the other side is you've, you've got to show up as you. That's what people expect. That's what people want. That's what draws them to you. And if it, they're not drawn to you, then you want to know that as well. But, you know, I spent, you know, years putting on the different masks, showing up like how I thought I was supposed to for a particular group. And fucking exhausting and you think you're doing the right thing, but you're, you're just out of sorts. Right. And so I think the reason why, you know, yourself, me, Aubrey, whoever, we just show up that way. And it doesn't matter if someone's an NFL football player or they're a yogi or what it's, they see the real you. And that's what people, that's what we connect to. We, we immediately know like, Oh, that's why I was drawn to you. Like, that the, the first time we sat doing NAD at On It, it's like, who is this guy? I need to be around him more because I feel, I guess I feel like myself. I feel like I can be myself. And uh, yeah, there's no weird, there's just a weird energetic that happens when we're not that way. And I think that's, 
an important thing that, you know, I think we all struggle, can struggle with from time to time. And so anyway, back to the gun yeah, thing. I just think yeah. that was an important no, part. It, absolutely. And, and I have been in the, in those shoes of the mask and the persona, you know, through high school and it is fucking exhausting. <laughs> Cause you're like, I'm going to be myself tonight. And everybody's like, well, where's Kingsbury? And I'm like, ah, oh, I got to do that again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They have an expectation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so either they, either they love you for who you are. You don't want them to love you for who you're not, you know, yeah. or they don't like you for who you are. And then cool. That saves some time. Right. But getting it's, back it, to the, the knowing cool people, it helps that I, you know, trained with Tim Kennedy. He came out of the pit have a long history with John Hackleman and Chuck and those guys. And, um, since moving here, he's been such an awesome dude who took me under his wing. I was coming from California. Didn't I own like a single handgun, that kind of shit. And since getting to train with him and go to a lot of the firearms classes, I mean, in, in big part, he's why I train jujitsu and why I go back to boxing, you know, just like you got to keep the sword sharp, even if you never use it. And something that I get better, it's not like I'm ever going to fight again. And I, and I pray I never need to punch someone on the fucking streets. That'd be a bad move. Um, but I feel better. Like it, it scratches an itch that I can't get to from weightlifting or meditation. And it's been, it's been awesome getting back into that stuff. And also another great guy that I got introduced to, Clay Martin. Fantastic dude. He's the author of Prairie Fire and Concrete Jungle. The Wrath of Wendigo is his new one. Um, he was a Marine recon sniper. He's one of the best shooters in the world. And so he's been working with us on the long gun training. Dude, Tucker Max introduced us and it's like, fuck yeah, dude. Like, this is so cool. I went, I went uh, hunting in uh, Northern Colorado for elk for my second time in my adult life. And, you know, was totally skunked the first one. And we I remember it. you telling <laughs> me so about bad. that. And wah, so wah. Yeah. But that's a part of the deal, you know? So with that level of respect and reverence and also, you know, expectation, but like trying to fucking keep that expectation really, really far down. We were successful and it was just magnificent. It was one of the most challenging hunts, 8,000 feet elevation, snow on the ground. I'm fucking falling everywhere, but not trying to fall away from the mountain, fall towards the mountain. Oh yeah. And, um, 32 mile an hour wind and just a lot of cool things that, that had I not have talked to clay and worked with some different people on or been to sheepdog, there's no way I would have fucking made that shot. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really just a powerful, a powerful moment and a pow really beautiful way to honor and love that animal. You know, we, I was thinking about elk chili for weeks and then, uh, my buddy who works with me on the ranch, who was a Navy EOD, Eric, his wife makes the best chili. So I was like, can we do elk chili? And so like, that's the way we all got together. Their three kids, my two kids, all families, you know, and we ate and honored this amazing, amazing animal. So you know, I have the prayer that I never need to shoot something with two legs. Uh, and at the same time, just scratching those, those things allows me to sleep better personally. And then it does translate. It's not like it's a skill that I'm never going to use. It, it helps with hunting. It helps with a lot of things where I'm, I for sure um, want to be good at. And, you know, having taken poor shots in the past and listening to pigs squeal for, at 45 yards and having to sprint to I finish mean, it, yeah, that's, that's something you can't erase, you know? So the importance of, of really making sure that you honor the animal with a clean shot and don't take it otherwise, you know, like that's always ever present for me. So really getting good at that and dialing in has made it uh, just a really awesome experience. You know, they're all, it's always an awesome experience, but it just keeps getting better and better. So yeah, the gun thing's been getting great. Um, we're going to have clay out at the farm to do a, a two day a long, long range and tactical. So I'm pumped for that. And, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool. And then the farm is just like, it's my baby, you know, like it's, it's literally like an infant. It needs the most care, you know, right from the jump. It needs all of its care really in the first seven years, like kids do. And then mm. after that, it's going to be, you know, because of the permaculture setup and the way we're working with our animals, it's really just going to be kind of turnkey, you know, where everything is systematized and easy to work with and, so it started out with, uh, you give people some context. How many acres is it? Is it a hundred? 118 acres. Excuse me. Yeah. 118 acres. Um, there's an existing home. There's some, you know, uh, buildings for storage. Big barns. Yeah. In 2020, you know, our fit for service looked like it wasn't going to happen. And so it uh, kept getting pushed back. We wanted to go to Tahoe in California. That couldn't happen. So we went to the Nevada side. And, um, 
it ended up being really powerful because it was for a lot of people, the first time they'd hugged anyone the whole year. Oh shit. And then October we finished in Sedona at Aubrey's ranch, same fucking thing, you know? And, and we had, um, we'd wanted to do our meetups at these usual places that we went to. And they're like, Hey, it's 20 person maximum. Oh yeah. You know? So we were like, fuck dude, we got 150 people. We can't do that. So <laughs> we terraformed his backyard on 40 acres in Sedona and brought in these big, uh, awesome TPs that, that uh, tied into each other, kind of like Burning Man. Come on. And we had everyone there. And that was the first time Perongi played live for anyone. Oh, yeah. He was doing all year. this stuff online. Yeah. yeah. So, like, that was just a powerful moment. And I had really been in Aubrey's ear, like, hey, we really need land locally. We need another place like Sedona where we can host people. Oh, man, that's burping, 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 burping. Burp it down. Um, you know the power. That's why you wait to do face-to-face interviews, right? Like yeah. there is a powerful thing that takes place when you're in each other's energy field that you can't get online. And for everything we teach online, that's cool. Uh, they're gaining a lot of, of knowledge per se, but it's, it's the embodiment, the embodiment of that that becomes wisdom, right? And it's going through the practices together, like going through a five-day fasting mimicking diet, doing the sauna and the ice bath every day, or coming and doing an ecstatic dance. And you're like, this is fucking weird. What am I doing? This feels weird. I don't want to do that. And you just keep pushing yourself through it until you unlock shit. You didn't realize you can unlock, um, you know, the holotropic breath work, whether that's with Anahata or Lucas and Hella, we have some phenomenal people for that. And I think being face to face and doing this stuff in a large group really does, it does change everything. So that became ever present. And then that was really, you know, when on it sold, one of the biggest things where I was just like, come on, we got to do it. We got to do it. And he's like, all right, cool. And uh, we found this place in Lockhart. How many places had you seen before you settled on that one? I think there was probably 10 that we had looked at online and visited four. Okay. As far out as Fredericksburg too, you know, like 90 yeah, minutes west. And fuck, that, from what's that, an hour and a half from here? Yeah. Yeah. Versus 30 minutes from the airport, right? Yeah. So every, the stars lined up and um, yeah, three pristine, like it flows right with the agriculture we're doing, three pristine natural ponds. Um, it's a really cool clay soil. You know, you can dive into the nerdy steer around that, but like it came turnkey. It came with a really nice home. The guy was a builder. It did it custom. Very cool home. Really cool. And then a couple of barns that had air conditioning and bathrooms and water. Um, tractor shed with the tractor. We you know, got some other implements and things like that. And this field he was using that's uh, flat and untouched was a sun- wild sunflower field. And because he wasn't producing stuff, he wasn't spraying nasty chemicals into anything. He was just using that for an ag exemption. So we did our soil analysis in three different places on the land. It had super high organic content and it had nothing nothing bad in it. There was no glyphosate. There's no anything, no wow. mesquite. Like I was just like, this is the perfect thing. Cause it's not going to take us years to rewrite this. It, we're starting from a great place. And, um, you know, for me, it was a big, it, I felt that so much pressure around taking this on and a lot of, you know, knowing, uh, just enough about Steiner to know, I don't know shit about biodynamic farming, yeah. just enough about regenerative agriculture to know, I don't shit, no shit compared to Alan Saber yeah. and these guys. <laughs> yeah. And like, you're looking at people that have spent their whole lives in that. Uh, and I had a few journeys, you know, in 2021 that just kept circling back to there's, we are one, there's one degree of separation. There's no six degrees of separation. So I have one degree of separation from any expert in any field. If I tune into that and I make the fucking call, it's going to happen. And sure enough, that's what's happened. We've brought in guys like Chad Johnson, who's a Sepholzer understudy. Uh, we work with Daniel Griffith, who was on my podcast. He's out in uh, Virginia. He's an Alan Savory hub. So the legends of the legends, you know, we're working with some of their best apprentices and learning firsthand and really deep diving it all. And a lot of us, you know, my wife has the most experience on a farm because she grew up on one. Everyone else that we've hired has no experience the first fucking run, you know? And then with that, everyone's eager to learn and we have the best people firsthand to learn from. So it's been, it's been awesome and it's taken a weight, definitely taken a huge weight off my chest and being surrounded by great people. But, um, it's been, it's been awesome and challenging and like full go, you know? And you're managing all this. Yeah. So everything runs through you. How many people do you have working at any given time out there? Well, thanks to Aubrey. We've got a full team, you know, we've got, we have a treasurer, uh, an accountant, a president carries our president. Yeah. We've got, uh, three guys. One's the plant manager, Brent, um, animal managers, Fox, and then Eric's the manager, manager that kind of oversees everything. And they're the, they're the guys that are 
eyes and ears on the ground doing stuff day in and day out. And I help where I can, but it's really, it's really those three guys, the farm boys that are doing it all and, and making it happen. And then I'm able to now dream into this 118 acre canvas effectively and see how do we want to paint this? What do we want to do? That's going to be in right relation with the land that'll enhance all ecosystems at once. And, uh, well, walk us around that painting a little bit. What's, what's out there? I mean, I know I've been out there, but. Um, yeah. So I, you know, watching like a uh, biggest little farm and seeing what they did on their 200 acres, right, there was a consideration of that. I actually had Zach Bush on the land and I was walking with them and I'm like, if we wanted to really make this high production, what do we do? It's covered in acacia and mesquite. Do we burn it and make biochar? Like that's, you know, that's been done for thousands of years, but it seemed, it just seemed too disruptive. Yeah. To just that's fuck the interesting. Whole thing up, yeah. You know? Yeah. I can, and, and, uh, I don't know shit about shit, but I could, that was what I felt when you said that. Yeah. Um, or do we, do we, you know, just start taking them all out and try to plant some other stuff, even though it's going to come back. It didn't make sense to do that much. And we didn't, one of the things that I've really prided myself on is I'm not trying to my best not to bite off more than I can chew because I still got a dad. I still got a husband. I still got a podcast and I still got a coach and fit for service. And, um, you know, thankfully we were able to handpick these guys that, that came on. They were all volunteers that were volunteering when Chad and his team were working. But we just, we, we, the first place we painted, I guess, is in that nine acre uh, flatland where we had the, the old sunflower field was because it was flat. There was no trees to take out. So we put in a spiral food forest with 400 fruit and nut trees, about a thousand plants total. And it all went in in a matter of like three weeks. So we were fucking hustling sun up to sundown, uh, about a year ago, you know, beginning of March and, uh, you know, piece by piece, we started adding the animals. We, Tosh and I ordered some, a bunch of different chickens online and they, they showed up at the post office. Those things have become super precious lately. They keep burning down all these factories, <laughs> motherfuckers. Man, every fucking time I see some stupid shit like that, I'm just like, all right. I appreciate the guidance. You know, like the, the God nods, the spirit nod, like, all right, that, that, that does matter. And, um, yeah, we raised those chickens in our house in Austin. We'd bring them outside each day, let them out on a little chicken run. I'd, I'd, you know, clean, we had a shower curtain Tosh would put down with all the chips on it. I'd go take that to the compost, dump it in there, spray it off. It was, it was a lot of extra work, but we wanted them to grow up with our kids. We wanted them to know our dog, you know, we wanted them to be cool with us all because we're not at the farm yet full time. And it really paid off. They're the sweetest, you know. We How could, long were they at your place for? Six weeks. Shit. So six weeks of doing that uh, first thing in the morning and then before sundown. So cool for the kids. <laughs> I mean, obviously Wolfie's, you know, maybe not as, as uh, uh, cognizant of what's going on, or I guess she's just seeing it from a different lens. But, she loves it. She but for yeah. Bear, like, got to get up, going to go do this. Like I could see it being such a special part of his day. Yeah. And you get to see like, really when you're that close to them, just how much personality they have. Like they're like dogs and cats. They're that different from one another. Um, one of them uh, we called Dora, Dora the Explorer. Cause mm -hmm. she would, she figured out how to get out of the little trough first. And then we put a pack and play in. she kept figuring out how to get out and she'd sit on my lap while we were eating. Come on. You know, and I could, I could hold her back if she would look like she was going to peck at one of my, <laughs> something on my plate. She was awesome. She laid it, you know, if I drive onto the farm and I leave my, my truck doors open, she gets in there and she'll lay eggs in my center console. Oh it's pure comedy. Oh my right? she's, God. She's awesome. And there's, there's a lot that are like that. Um, just, just really fantastic and chill and you can pick them up and they'll kind of squawk for a second. You just hold them and pet them and then they calm down like, oh, okay, I'm good. So it, it, that was worth it. You know, we brought in sheep. And, uh, that was probably one of the hardest lessons ever. Cause like lives are on the line if I make a bad decision. And I in what, in what regard we were the only people that brought in a giant food source and didn't protect it. Yep. So we had them out there and I was, I mean, I knew coyotes existed, but I'm like, oh, the sheep should be cool. And we got game fence around, you know, for the, for the game. It didn't matter at all. Like <laughs> we lost six sheep in one night and I was like, fuck, that's uh a pretty large percentage of what we're working with here, starting with 50 of them. You know, if we yeah. continue at that rate, we're not going to have a flock to protect. So we went and got a couple uh, Pyrenees puppies that are awesome, but also too young for the job. And uh, each of us was spending the night there camping effectively with the herd, trying to protect them, didn't lose any. And we were curious to know if like this, these dogs can handle the load. 
because coyotes smell dog piss and they know there's a dog there. They don't know that it's a puppy or an old one. They just know there's dogs here. Okay. My hope was that they were going to be cool with that and, and able to defend the land. We took one night off and lost seven more. One night. Fucking one night. So what's the deal? The coyotes know you're there too? I mean. Yeah, they are the smartest of the smartest. I'm telling you, like we had <laughs> got fucking night vision, thermal scopes, all the things. I could hear them in the pack just doing their roll call, sounding off. And um, they would stay just behind the tree line because that has its own infrared. So you can't see past me on that from a distance at least. You know, if I was getting close, maybe. But uh So then we went and got four other dogs. They were mixed with Pyrenees and Anatolian Shepherd and older, you know, between like a year and a half to three years. And then we got a little God nod gift. There was a friend of ours has a ranch and he's like, I got this great Pyrenees adult who's a male that won't leave my property. It's clear that he left. It's clear that he was a guardian dog, but he might've been mistreated. Anyways, he's a sweetheart, but I can't take him. Would you guys want him? This is right after we picked up the other dogs. We're like, absolutely. So we drive over and I'm checking on his temperament. He's, you know, kind of cautious. Then his tail starts wagging. I'm petting him. He rolls to his back. I'm petting him. I'm like, dude, this guy's awesome. And so um, I go to pick him up. Like, I'll see if he bites me. Doesn't bite me. <laughs> only, <laughs> only you. <laughs> put, him in the, <laughs> put him in the truck. And he's got both front paws in the center console, just watching where we're going the whole way back. And he's like king of the hill now. We named him Zeus. and um, They've been awesome. We haven't lost a single thing since the, the female dogs will come up and lick the, the lambs and the newborns and like sleep right next to our baby cows that we have two bulls now. So we got 13 heifers, all were pregnant, uh, late stage. We had our first two born on the land were two bulls and uh, all of them are due within the next five months. The sheep, the, the cattle, you know, and, and really like figuring that out too, like what's best for the land. Um, if we're going to do as natural as possible, Needs, they need to be tuned to the land. They need to have been born here, but really like their, their breed, their heritage needs to vibe with Texas. They need to be able to handle a cold winter and still. How was the freeze for, for, for all of them? They're amazing. Well, I got, you know, thankfully we got friends, right? So I'm buddies with Taylor and the guys at Rome Ranch who uh, run Force of Nature. And they've been doing this a lot longer. They got 1500 acres and regenerative bison. And I'm like, we want to get some sheep or some goats. And he goes, oh, I got the guy. Austin Dillon, he's uh, counterculture farms. And I was like, fuck yeah. So we intro, get intro to them and we're telling him everything we're looking for. Hey, we're going to run cows with them. And he's like, well, you got kids. I wouldn't get the goats. I was like, really? Goats are great. And he's like, well, the billies are a little much for the kids. You wouldn't want one getting crammed, you know? Like, oh. I was like, all right. So we go with the sheep and uh, they're just so much friendlier and docile. And it's taken them a while for them to warm up, but they've totally warmed up to us. We were we had a couple of donkeys and we were giving one a bath, a little bonita. And as we were giving him a bath, the matriarch of the flock got curious and came over to us to make sure like everything's fine. We're not hurting this animal. And they saw that we were just loving on her and brushing her coat and everything. She came right up to Wolf and I, I was on a knee and then eyeballed us and let her, let us pet her. And from that moment on, the whole flock would come over now because she was the matriarch and she said, she checked us out. Okay. You guys are cool. And you got to understand they came out of like, Oh, a flock of 400 plus very little human interaction other than seeing one lay food out in the winter time. That's about it. You know, like they weren't tended in the way that we're tending them because the numbers were there. You know, there's too many numbers to, to deal with that. And we've been feeding the cows by hand with alfalfa and just making the, helping them to warm up. So there's been so much that there's relationships everywhere. You know, the relationship with the land is kind of hard to check in on other than like really tuning in and seeing what's working, what isn't. Um, but the relationship with the animals has been something that's just been awesome because it's, you know, they are aware and they are awesome. And even though we're going to eat them at some point, um, it's just an in- incredible thing to be a part of, to know like, oh, we're taking care of these guys and, and our guardian dogs are taking care of them now. And, and we love the guardian dogs. We, you know, the point at which I shot um, hit, hit a shoulder on the way out and it's 300 wind mags. So it just mangled it. And uh, we took all that. We didn't waste any of it. And we're giving that to the dogs. So now the dogs will shit that elk out and feed the soil with that right on the land. So it's a way to recycle and honor the elk that, you know, and, and also feed our dogs something better than kibble because they're awesome and they're doing the great work protecting them so we don't have to lose sleep at night. Oh, well, you know, I think one of the things that was most fascinating to me that I wouldn't have anticipated 
was just seeing the relationship between the sheep and the, and the guardian dogs. And, you know, as much as you're talking about, you know, your relationship to the land and, you know, the relationship that, you know, we have all these kind of connections, but just to, to see that it, it was, I mean, I really have a hard time describing, but just to like, to be present, to witness that was like special. And that was, I think the thing for me when we were going around that, that really um, was inspiring to me, like, oh, there, there's, there's something so special going on here that again, I can kind of put my finger on it, but I can't, but there's, there's, it reminds me of when I was, um, in South Africa at the game reserve and just to see how nature is. I felt like I, I got to see how nature is in a way that I just don't get to experience it. And I think you talking about the relationship with the chickens you had at home, you see them like a a dog or a cat. They have like, I've never witnessed that. I don't know. That's foreign to me. I know what a dog and a cat are. I know what a pig is, right? Petunia. But there's something that um, your kids aren't going to learn in school. You're not going to, it's, it's a reminder to you and to your nature and for your kids to have such early exposure to that, you know, and I know we talked uh, before we got on about, you know, maybe one of my boys going out and spending some time at the farm. I can parent him as amazingly as I can. And I can't, I can't give him what that farm can give him. And I think it's just recognizing it was just like, now I'm just kind of processing it as we're talking <laughs> like what's my lane, what, you know, and, and, and really how can I show up for my kids and what things do I kind of need to outsource um, and being okay with that um, and actually being excited about that. I think when early on as a parent, I remember Peyton wanted to get a male nanny, uh, you know, and and dude, I was like, I'm going to be the man that raises my kids. I was like, so shut off. And I don't know if I was insecure. There were all these things that I was, I mean, this was guys, this was more than 10, 15 years ago, maybe, I don't know, but I just laugh at that now because that was um, ultimately not serving them in a way that, you know, I see things differently right now. I, I mean, you know, Kyle, I, I want my kids to be, I want my boys and, you know, hope, but I want my boys to be around my friends, those men. And so that those men are actually helping me raise my boys by showing up with integrity. What does that mean? I can talk about it, but when you're in that space, you just feel how it's different. And I think that's one of the reasons Bowen loves hanging out with you so much. And whenever, you know, there are men around the house or out here at the property, he wants to be a part of it. And he he doesn't give a shit who else is there. He just wants to hang with the dudes. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about kids his age. No. (laughs) He wants to hang with the adult boys. So I think you're you know, a long way to say that there is something really special happening there that I'm doing my best to describe. But when you're there, you just feel it. It's like, okay, this is the, this is the unlearning. This is the, the place to get back in touch with nature, much like I felt like when I was in South Africa. You're just, you're in their world. You feel like that. And that's, special because I think so much of our lives were, we're the dominant ones and you know, you could be as, as awake as you want to be, but it's hard not to take on a little bit of that kind of energy. And, uh, again, it's who you're surrounding yourself with. If everyone feels like, okay, we're the dominant ones and the animals feed us. And there's this, this really, this disconnection there, that connection is, it, I felt it in Lockhart. It was really special. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for saying that. That's something you know, when you go to Sedona for those that can, with the eyes to see and the, the ears to hear and the, the, the heart to feel, you feel different. It's palpable. Some, for a lot of people, it's hard to sleep at night. 
And we're not going to recreate Sedona. Sedona is its own fucking thing. It's its own eco field, as Dr. Will Tegel would say. But when we got there in Lockhart, it already had some feel to it. That's, that's what was drawing us. As we've continued to work with the land, that's everything to us. Like right when someone gets there, there's like a, oh, something's different here. You know, and just really feeling that is a palpable thing. You know, the, uh, as above, so below, right? If we're, if we're able to heal the land and, and bring it back to its full potential, what does that do for us? What does that do for the people that come here, you know, for a service retreat or for anything else? You know, that, that palpable feeling, big shit happens, you know, like we're, one of our... <laughs> One of our most ridiculous nights of all time. Oh, God. Uh, medicine night. Shit happens. Like, like, yeah, it was like some fucking crazy cosmic, you know, blood moon. Venus is closer than usual. Something like that, you know, or just like a lot of. All uh, very <laughs> alpha males with, with the exception of one who is doing his best to hold it down. The feminine. <laughs> yeah. And he just, he had to full surrender. He had to give up. He had to give up. Mm. Um that night would have happened anywhere else. You know, Sedona was the container that allowed us to fucking pop and still not die and hold it together, you yeah. know? And so I think about that, what container are we creating? And it's going to be, I mean, I haven't, there's, there's so many things I can't figure out. It's like the podcast. I love the question mark because the question mark is going to be dope, but it remains a mystery to me until I go through the dope podcast. Raising our kids there, I didn't grow up that way. You know, I grew up in a city. I thought it was a small town, 120,000 people. I thought that was a small town just by comparison to San Jose and San Francisco. Um, and Lockhart's like 12,500 people, but growing super fast as all the places are in Texas. And it is like, I have no idea what that's going to do for them. Being on the land, you know, being like, there's no kid now where, where your parent basically tells you to F off, get out of the house in a nice way or not a nice way. Like that's what my mom says. She's like, you get the fuck out of here and come back at dinner. And nobody gets to do that anymore. That's not how it works in the modern world. Uh, in a 118 acre container with, you know, eight foot fences. Absolutely. We can do that. You know, I guess they like take the walkie talkie, get out of here, come back for lunch. You know, I'll ring yeah. you at noon. And, and that's giving them something back that I had that was super valuable that they really can't get now. You know, kids get picked up from school and driven to the next thing and then driven to the next thing. And then if they want to go to their friends, you got to drop them off and it's all these little containers, but it's not, it's not the same as like being in nature with a group of friends. And it's like, all right, you old kids, you got to watch out for the young ones. Don't let the young ones get hurt. It's on you, right? Yeah. You're responsible. Like what that teaches kids to do in terms of establishing their own uh, ability to teach and communicate with each other and, and really look out for one another. You know, like there's a, there's a lot of good things we're doing with bear. Violin is awesome. Uh, Jiu-jitsu has been awesome. But there's some those intangibles that he's going to get on the land that you can't really account for are the things that I'm most curious about and fascinated with. Yeah, dude, that's, I think, in you know, dude, yeah, obviously I grew up much the same way. And when, when you're, you know, like you said, picking up the kid, dropping them off, and then when they're home, if you're engaged in anything, generally they're doing something like on a phone, on a pad, they're, they, they, it's just not the natural inclination to go out and throw a tennis ball against the side of the house or up on the roof and try to catch it. Like all the shitty fun games that we came up with because we didn't have any other options. The TV, nothing was on TV at, you know, 11 in the morning and you're just like, okay, what am I going to do? And so I think that it's just, it's going to be such a cool experience for them. And, uh, you know, and I think we should probably connect the dots here. You're going to be moving out there. The family's moving out to the ranch. End of the year. Hopefully. By the end of the year. Knock on wood. You know, there's all kinds of pushbacks and things like that and delays. But yeah, we're really hoping to be moved in before Christmas. And if it's not, if it's January or February next year, it'll be within a year. So that's, that's fantastic. And share a little bit about the house you're building and what yeah. the materials yeah. and the... I was, I was looking into domes. I was looking into all sorts of shit. I remember you yeah. sending me some stuff. Yeah. yeah it was some pretty <laughs> wild shit. Well, I wanted to build something that would last. You know, we, we rented the first place we lived in Austin. We were renting just cause it was close to on it. And I didn't know about seepage. I didn't know about clay and what can happen with foundations. And, you know, over time we started seeing cracks in the ceiling and it looked like some type of horror movie where the shit just starts splitting. And, um, in the kitchen, right in the corner, on the ground, it dropped six inches by the time we left. What? So I could put, you know, 
almost two fists stacked on top of each other through this hole in the ground where anything can come in. Like we're fucking, we put diatomaceous earth, fucking ant spray, you name it. I did not want an infestation. Wait, where was this happening in the house? In the the kitchen. What? Yeah. (laughs) It's like the worst place on earth to have it happen. (laughs) We know we have mice living in the backyard. Like we know we have mice. Six inches. Yeah, it was massive. And it happened relatively quickly. We were there for two years, but it was really the last six months where like shit just fucking moved for us. And so that kind of stayed in my mind, you know, and, and really houses now, you know, like present excluded, right. They're not built to last. We bought our first home in Austin, which is a new build, uh, suburb style, you know, it's a nice, but cookie cutter houses are stacked on top of each other. And, um, it's probably got 30 years. Even if, this, even if the ground doesn't move on it, 30 years before, you know, walls start cracking you need to refinish stuff and, and put in, put in different things. Dude, to your point, this house that we're in right now is, is 30 years old. Yeah. And it looks, it looks like it was built yesterday. Like it's modern. I mean, it's truly, it's, they it's, don't it's incredible. build them like this anymore. Not at all. Everything about it is just rock solid. Yeah. Yeah. And so really thinking into that, I was thinking, well, domes will last a long time and I'm looking into different material styles and. Um, you know, classic domes are, can be a little bit smaller on the small side and then you got to connect them and it doesn't feel like there's any one central gathering place in them. We found this place called monolithic in, uh, Northern Texas. And we were looking into that. But then as we started to really get practical, you know, like where do you put your gun safe or your refrigerator or your cabinet? Everything has to be custom because of the curvature. Oh, fuck, dude. Or you put it, or you, you know, you put walls on the inside, which removes the dome look, and then you've got fucking your fridge and those things against it. And you're kind of, you know, you're losing all this space where it curves. And, um, you know, there's no resale value. There's nothing nice about that. And I just, I, I was looking at earth ships as well. Like I wanted a green home that would last a long time. What's an earth ship? Um, they a home. They started in Taos, New Mexico. And it's basically like a three of the walls are earth. It's soil, right? So you dig out, you take tires and it's all recycled shit. So you take uh, recycled tires, you pound dirt into them. So they puff up like they'd be full of air. And then you stack those and you make this little three, three walled fortress. And then that has earth around that. And you put vents in so you can get air ducts to move through. And then your fourth wall is effectively a giant, giant glass piece that effectively acts as your greenhouse. So you live indoors with all of your plants. You obviously have the highest amount of oxygen for being indoors. Um, and they're a heat sink too. So in summertime, they're pulling in a lot of that heat for you. And it's, it's pretty cool, but it's also, again, no real sale value. And, and it ends up being just as much as a regular home is because of the amount of glass you need. And because of the manpower, it takes an hour of pounding each tire. And you're looking at thousands of tires, right? Thousands of hours. It's it's dudes like us knocking it in, right? It's not, it's not Tosh, you know, smashing that thing. Right. So thinking about that. I love that you said dudes like us. Yeah. Yeah, Me and you. Yeah. Yeah, We're both the same. You got it. (laughs) And um, so, yeah, I kept, I kept looking and I actually asked one of the, you know, just, I just threw it out there kind of like a shot in the dark to one of my, one of my groups with, guys like Mickey and people like that in there. And I was like, if anybody knows something around, you know, green housing, that's going to last a while, please shoot it to me. And one of my buddies immediately wrote back. He's like, I'm buddies with this guy, Andrew Dennis. He started a company called Gigacrete. Uh, he was an architect in LA for 30 years. He did the, um, he did the New York, New York in Vegas. And then after he did the New York, New York, he just stayed there and got out of LA as we all should. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> He uh, really wanted to get into greenhousing and things that could be built to last. So he started looking for different materials. So funny. He started with New York, New York. Mm, yeah, in yeah. Vegas. I mean, yeah. He was doing other things for 30 years. But yeah, it was, it was, you know, like the final, the New York, New York's crazy. There's yeah. a story behind that too. If I can, uh, if I can go off trail here for a second. Obviously. Uh, they told him to do the New York skyline for New York, New York. This is like. By the way, there's the very first casino I ever went to in Vegas and stayed at was the New York, New York. No shit. Yep. So, so he does his, he does his preliminary drawing and it's a nice drawing, but it's like, it's not super detailed or anything. And just as a, tell me if you like it. And it's all of the main pieces of New York. And they say, cool, do a second one, make it a little sharper. And that, and that's it. That's it. We're going to run it. He's like, no shit. So he does the second one, but as he's doing the second one, he gets this intuition. He's like, I don't know why, 
No. But the Twin Towers no. aren't going in there. If no. you've been to fucking New York, New York, it was built way before 9-11. Well, yeah, you were, as you're saying it, I'm like, I'm trying to picture it. And I was like, I don't remember seeing the Twin Towers there. Oh yeah, they never were there. So he God. gets the nod like, oh, they don't belong. And he draws it, he draws it up without him, doesn't mention it. And then somebody brought it up and he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't think they belong. And then they're like, all right, no problem. Build it this way. So it gets built without the twin towers. Right. It's fucking crazy. It was like four years before or five years, before, something like sure. that, six years before. And, um, anywho, it was funny because you got a buddy in the FBI and then like, I was going to say there has drilled him. <laughs> he, <just> drilled him. <laughs> he was sweating bullets. He's like, I promise you, it was just a weird intuition. I got, you know, so, um, thankfully no issues there, but. Yeah, he got into this stuff, um, big accrete, and and it's a steel structure. So it's steel beams with panels in between. The panels are food materials. Everything's edible by itself until it's mixed together, and then it creates a certain level of strength. Um, and then the steel's anchored into the concrete uh, foundation. And it's so strong now that they have it Category 5 hurricane proof approved for commercial and residential in Miami-Dade County. Oh shit. And he's got photos of their one house in Nassau in the Bahamas that went through a category five hurricane. And the structure was so sound that the only repairs needed was to use a wrench to bend a couple of places, the rain gutters back. That's how strong this shit Come is. Come on. Right. And everything else looks like scattered toothpicks. Like the aerial shots are like, yeah. that looks like a fucking scattered. <laughs> Those are all the other houses that are built normal. Right now. We don't have to worry about hurricanes here, but mold proof is a big one. Big one in Texas. I mean, a lot of our, Mike Dillard, a lot Mike of buddies Dillard, that are just yeah. fucking hammered from mold just because of these freezes. And you don't know. It's a silent killer. You've got no idea it's there until it's too late and you're sick and you got to fucking run all these different labs and, you know, figure out some really weird technology like 10 pass ozone therapy, whatever it is that's super expensive to help eliminate that. Um, so mold proof's a big one. Fireproof, uh, pretty much bug proof because it is very, it's a very tight container. Um, and, and less than standard building materials. It's less than standard building no materials. Shit. And it's, there's a way they can check on like how long things wear down. There's some kind of industrial grade dishwasher that you run like a, a, a tile through to see what, what the general, um, erosion would be from rain and sun and these kind of things. And it's not a one-to-one, -one, but they think it'll last a thousand years. It's like, yeah, that's seven generations. I think we're good there. It'd be, it'd be good. Yeah, I think we're all right. Yeah. You know, like it's built to last. Uh, nothing's going to take it down. It's earthquake proof to, you know, they, 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 did a, they did some earthquake tests and whatever the highest earthquake in human history is, it's, they go way beyond that, way beyond that. So it's really cool. And you can even go, even have the shit called ballisticrete. You know, they're working with the Department of Defense and it's $12 a square foot. So it's not exactly economical. To That's build the new house stuff? Bulletproof. Um, it's a finish that they do. Oh, okay. And with that finish, you can make any room you want bulletproof. Oh. So we've got master bedroom is going to be bulletproof just in case. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a fun feature. You it's know? a so fun like, feature <laughs> if nothing else. Yeah. I'll be 60 years old and there'll be, you know, my son's girlfriend or something like that. And I'm like, your dad's a fucking weirdo. You know, I'm already that guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm already working my way that direction. But um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's a cool thing and it's completely green. It has a very high R rating for, um, insulation. So just fantastic. Like I couldn't be happier with it. That's what we're building right now. And they look gorgeous. They don't look like some weird ass fucking dome. They look like Tony Stark's house. Like oh. everything in this guy's folder. A lot of them are in LA and in uh, nicer areas. And they're just incredible. They look, they look gorgeous, you know, lots of glass, lots of beauty. So I'm, I'm really excited for that. And it's going to be not massive, but twice as big as our house is currently. So we will have a lot more space. It's going to be a one story. Um, with a flat top roof, but flat tops at different levels. So we'll have like a 15 foot star deck where we can go up and hang on and just, you know, 10 naked if we want and just relax and of course. see everything, look at the stars. And what's cool too, is I didn't find this out until I was 38. I was actually out here in Spicewood. Um, this guy who had worked with the Bush senior administration and was kind of on the inside of the, of the animal um, was in Ecuador because the Bush administration was working on something with big oil, of course. This is our friend, David. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so he's working on that and he ends up drinking ayahuasca with the locals and fucking completely changes his outlook. Comes back on his way back. He stops in Costa Rica, does zip line. And he's like, I got to bring this. So he's, the, was the first place to do zip lines in all of North America. And he built all these incredible tree houses 
the first thing I noticed walking through with you guys was I was like, there's, there's no windows. Like, aren't you, it's like, we're, there's a Creek right here. Like, what are, you, what are you doing, dude? You expect, you just handing out like gallons of bug spray. And he's like, no, they don't fly higher than 15 feet. Like I'm 38, dude, I'm 40 now. But I was like, I've never heard that in my life. How is this new information? And clearly that's the case. None of us were walking on these cool Brit, you know, bridges and things like that. It looked yeah. like Indiana Jones and no issues at all with mosquitoes up there. So we're right at that height. So I'm pumped. Like we'll be able to make our way out of the mosquito haven. Oh, that's you know? so really, awesome. Really good. And then what do we, we have like any kind of uh, growth deal on any of the roofs or anything like that? We can do some rooftop it's gonna stuff. going to be a better way to say that than growth deal. <laughs> you get that growth deal? You, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we talked about doing bees up there. We talked about a lot of different things, but um, really it's just going to be surrounding the area. One of the cool things is we're working with an aerobic septic because, um, you know, I, getting into all this regenerative stuff and what sustainability actually looks like in a weird way, you know, your own waste come, becomes a part of that. Right. And, um, Adrian Grenier actually showed me this book called humanure and it's all on recycling human shit. Now, China and Korea have done it for maybe at least centuries, right. For a very long time. No We've shit. done that. A lot of poor countries do this and there's a way to cure anything where then you're not going to get fucked up and get disease from it. Um, but we're not going to, you know, like compost out houses are a little, little down the road, but for now, it's going to be, all of our waste is going to run through a aerobic system. And instead of having a leach field, it's going to go through irrigation and it's going to go to our non edible trees, all the oaks, things like that. And back to the grass and the animals actually prefer that and uh, no issues there, no issues at all. So with their microbiome. Um, so I'm thrilled that like, it's, it's literally full circle with what we're eating and how we're putting that back. I think about that, you know, from the elk meat, getting the dogs to getting back in the land as soon as possible. You know, if we have, um, even thought about that with my death in a weird way, like doing whatever's necessary so that my body doesn't get pumped full of formaldehyde, but allowing the animals first to take my flesh and recycle it. And then if you want to bury the bones, go for it. But um, giving it back as soon as possible because bodies aren't meant to break down in a fucking coffin mm. over thousands of years, you know, like that everything, everything must give itself back to the earth, you know, and that's kind of the, the thing. Like we're on borrowed time. Um, I forget the line from Nako, but, but uh, yeah, the return, how fast can I return this awesome vessel that I've been given for 80 years or a hundred years and give it back to the, to, to what I've created right there. You know, that's where I want to be. I want this body recycled right where we live. And um, you'd be a hell of a meal for some coyotes. We we'll get them <laughs> off the sheep for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I would for certain. <laughs> for certain. Chickens too, though. You know, they, they'd be oh, yeah. great. we've been giving out the elk bones for the chickens because our dogs would fight over the bones. So we're like, all right, nothing for them. But the chickens just pick that thing absolutely clean. Really? Yeah. And they're great. I mean, they're, they're total omnivores. But they love meat. They absolutely love meat. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Yeah. So you're doing some stuff for fit for service out there. So just for people who aren't familiar, give us a, a little snapshot. What is fit for service? And obviously if, if there's something open, like I want you to sell it a little bit too, because I think what you guys are doing is amazing, but I want to also hear about the, you know, what you're dropping into. Yeah. Fuck yeah. We, we, Aubrey, Aubrey had a, a vision done at Don Howard's place about creating a container where we could put people through, you know, the paces around everything that we knew that was transformative. Legally, right? Like we're not fucking hosting ayahuasca. And just so okay, people know, you know, Don Howard. Don Howard, uh, Waller, who recently passed away, was a medicine man and curandero, primarily focused on Wachuma as his main medicine, but also guided for ayahuasca. Um, grew up in Kentucky. His grandmother was a medicine woman. And then uh, through a series of peyote journeys, peyote basically told him, this is where you're going to go. And it was Shavin, which is in the Andes. He made his way out there and worked with the cousin of peyote, Wachuma, which is a mescaline-based plant medicine. And that became his lifelong practice. I think he was 30, 40 years of working with that medicine and serving it. And, uh, you know, he's one of those guys like Dr. Will Tegel who just passed away where he is the medicine. You know, like there's just no fucking doubt, like being in someone's presence like that. A lot of people talked about that with Ram Dass, who I never got to meet. But like sitting in front of Ram Dass changes your eco field, right? It changes your energetic system. And you tap into that and it elevates it. No matter how you're feeling, you could just, you're just better for having been in front of this person. And um, Don Howard really had that. You know, he was, he was terrific. He was Aubrey's main medicine guy, you know, so the, the journeys that they had together, 
really influenced the trajectory of what Aubrey was doing. And he had that, that vision of just really creating something where we could take, you know, a, and by the way, Aubrey, group, Aubrey but, has a, um, uh, did a production on. Yeah. Yeah. He did the ayahuasca documentary. I think he did Wachuma one as well. Okay. Uh, and well, maybe we can l- link to that in the show notes because I've, I've seen those. They're amazing. Yeah. They're incredible. They're incredible. Get a sense and, uh, of who the man that's was. Where, him and Parangi. I mean, he had met Parangi before, but he had Parangi do the ayahuasca album for that documentary. Oh, and that's, shit. you know, when we're listening to that on our first night together, yes. you know, it's, it was birthed from that. So it's really cool to kind of trace that back. Um, but yeah, he had this vision and he knew it was, he wasn't ready for it. And then at a certain point in time, you know, we had kind of created everything we wanted to create it on it supplement wise. Like, this is what I'm going to do. I want you to be one of the coaches with me full time. Like I'm all in. Brought in Eric Godsey and Caitlin Howe, who were just exceptional as well. And we've grown so much together. It's one of the cool things is, is I, I have no problem saying I know a lot. I know a lot about health and wellness. I know a lot about plant medicines. I know a lot about the things in my wheelhouse. And still, we're always trying to learn more. We're always trying to be connected, you know, whether it be through the podcast or something else to these great thinkers, the best of the best. And that's, excuse me, one of the things that Fit for Service has afforded us is when we have our events, it's not just us putting people through the paces. We bring in amazing fucking people like Jamie Wheel, Zach Bush, Charles Eisenstein. Like oh, we have these shit. guys come out and they'll, Gangsters. they'll talk for fucking two hours and you and know, is, no. did I hear Boyd's coming to an upcoming one? He is, yeah. Here we're we go. I'm so pumped, dude. It, it's so ridiculous. He hasn't been at one of these before. I know. Like, I'm like what, what are we thinking? Why is it 2023? And this is the first one that Boyd's coming to. But yeah, I think we're going to have him. I'm not sure if we're having him in Lockhart or if we're having him uh, in Montana. I feel like it's Lockhart when I had talked to him. But I, would, for- I would love to have him there. We've had Charles and, and Zach on the land. So to get him there just feels right. You know, I yeah. Want his energy there. Felt and you, the a lot of Boyd fans on the podcast here. So if you're a little curious, just know that Boyd is going to be at one of these uh, coming up. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm super thrilled with that. Um, we had a, a, a brilliant medicine woman from Ecuador that came out to our last event. She talked a lot about the cyclical nature of time and, you know, having read the fourth turning and the yugas, these are like much bigger pictures. The yugas representing the, the 25,900 year great year, uh, much longer time scale than most people think about the, the fourth turning talking about these four seasons that last about 20, 21 years apiece. And now we're, you know, in this crisis period, right? Yes. Yeah, snap- give us a snapshot of like, kind of where we are, like when it started, when it's like. Yeah, we had, um, they've in any, in any world leading, uh, culture, they can track this cycle take place. And so in America, this is our fourth cycle. The previous three crisis periods, which last about 20 years, we had world war two and the great depression. Before that, we had the Civil War. And before that, we had the Revolutionary War. There's not small potatoes when we're talking about what happens in the crisis period. Uh, The crisis period, the winter, is followed by the spring, the high, and then the awakening, the summer, and then the unraveling. So like I was born in the 80s, right in the unraveling. And what's cool is culture mirrors this, right? So grunge rock and gangster rap come out in the 80s, mirroring this unraveling. And, um, you know, they predicted this crisis period would start in 2005, give or take three years. 2007 happens the stock oh, market, yeah, the 2008 with the housing, financial right? crisis. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. So it was right on, right on, right on pace with all this. And um, it's not to say shit doesn't happen in between. We have Vietnam in between, you know, like there's a lot of things. Yeah. Right. Between. Right. This perfect. isn't the only window folks. Come on, <laughs> get your shit together. <laughs> but uh, you know, with that, like the, the crisis is absolutely the crisis. And so this started for us in 07. It'll likely last till 2027 or 2030, you know, give or take a few years. Oh, right. It's a um, great reset. Yeah. That's what, that's a big drive for 2030 is all there. It's by design. It's not, it's not happening. They didn't pull that out of their ass, you know, like it's, it's there by design. Um, and not to say, you know, some guy's twisting his mustache, making all the calls behind, you know, some fucking cloaked blade. It's not like that, but, but, um, you know, people are, people that are in, in charge are privy to, to these cycles. And that's why I fell in love with Armstrong economics side note, you know, I can't he's, wait he's to listen to this. Brilliant dude. Brilliant guy. Um, so the smaller cycles, um, she was talking about her name's a Waira. She's a beautiful musician as well. She's going to come out to Lockhart and, and teach and sing at the same time. But she did a sweat lodge for me, Aubrey and, and the coaches. 
And she talked about these four-year cycles and how we had come to the completion of our first four-year cycle. No different than high school or college, we come to this completion and now we're venturing into new territory as we start the next. But it really felt like that. It felt like Sedona last year was, you know, it was, some, it was almost like a graduation, like a feeling of an ending, even though it doesn't end, but it did feel like yeah, that. some closure. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. As she was explaining that, I was like, man, I hadn't even thought of that, but that's the feeling I've had the whole time. It was the first, you know, for a long time, I would wonder, and I talked about this on Ob's podcast where I was like, please God, I hope this is, is going to do well. And then it became, please God, I hope this is as good as the last one because the last one was so awesome. And then every event that we'd throw was better. It became the best event of all time. And it, you know, it really was. Like it really was improving in that way. And uh, after a while, I just stopped wondering it. You know, I expected it. I knew it. And that's what's been so awesome about this, you know, is that it's, it fills my fucking cup every single time I'm there talking to people and I get to, I get to teach, but I also get to sit front row and learn with everyone else with so whatever important. they're going through. Yeah. And, and that just keeps, you know, I think that's, that's one of the secrets of youth is, is continuing to be a student because if you're doing that, especially when you got great teachers at hand, that lights the fire inside to keep going, you know, and there's so much to learn, but it's like, really like we're following that passion. Mark Gaffney, where is arrows guiding you? What is your desire? Where, what's the thing burning and alive in you to, to track next? And if you listen to that, there's a big payday involved in that. And it may not be a financial, but like there's some juice that comes from that every single time from that fruit. Um, so it's been, it's been incredible. We have a year long right now uh, that's closed. It may reopen if we lose a bunch of people, but I don't think we're going to lose a bunch of people. Why would you lose people? For some people, it's, it's, it's either financial. financial. Yeah. It's either financial or it's just not for them. You know, there's some, some life circumstances come up, uh, lose their job, get in a divorce, whatever the thing is. And if you could say it's for these people, how would you kind of describe who this is for? We did a 15 minute video really talking about what we are, but I mean, to, to briefly describe. And that's where we're, where are we going to find that? Cause we will link to that. Yeah. I'll get, I'll get that for you. It's on, it's on a uh, fit or aubreymarcus.com. Okay. And um, I, to say it's for everybody is, is not true, but at the same time, there's no, there's nothing that would cut you off. Like we've had men and women in their sixties. We've had uh, a lot of people in their fifties. We've had pretty young people, you know, in their early twenties, everyone in between fit people and completely unfit people that really want to learn, like, what is this about? How do I take care of my body? You know, everything in between. So you don't need um, to have like done a bunch of work to go there. It, it's no. introduct like you're going to get to touch a lot of different areas, to, no matter where you are with your level of mastery. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is everyone that you get to meet there, they're all tracking the same shit. They all want to grow. They all want to learn. They all want to be the best version of themselves. And the thing that we didn't expect from it, we knew we wanted to build community, but that far exceeded any expectations was the fact that you know, we're creating lifelong bonds with people, you know, like Aubrey did that with us, right? He's like, Kyle, you're doing NAD, be a guinea pig. I'm too chicken shit to do it. Yeah. Sorry, Ob, you were. Yeah, and, he was. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> and so, and I got to meet you and Lance and, and Tim and the boys and, and, you know, I, I love Lance and Tim and they're great guys and I can hit them up. And at the same time, I don't have the relationship I do with them as I do with you. Yeah. That was the one, right? And just one relationship like that, that can change your life. Fucking change your life. Yes. Yeah. And that's, we've created a funnel in a, a, a container that does that for people. We've had some of our fit first fit for service babies have been born from people who met in fit for service year one, right? Shit like that. Bro. You know, like it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fucking rad when you think about that business is starting all that shit. Yeah. Cool. That's small fries. You know, like we, kids are being born. Yeah. There's plenty of that going on the business stuff. Yeah, I'm plenty sure of that, you know, cause people are like-minded and they, need X, Y, and Z. And they find the person that knows X, Y, and Z and needed you, you know, and that's, yeah. that's a given. By the way, um, I love the way you use funnel because funnel usually has like, this kind of, this kind of a dirty word, right? <laughs> marketing, get people marketing in the funnel, funnel and the email and then close them. Yeah. But that's exactly what you've created. Not intentionally necessarily, but it's, it's, it's this great funnel of people that are by and large just curious. Yeah. And then there's the, you find the ones that show up as themselves and you're like, that guy's dope. She's amazing. Like, and then it's, it's done. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's, it's, 
we talk about what we're doing as, as ceremony, you know, when we meet with each other and there's no plant medicines involved and things like that, it's a different place. Go to Sultara or go somewhere, you know, another elite level place, go to Don Howard's in the Amazon at Spirit Quest. Um, but we, we are creating containers that are that transformative. And through the experiences that we do, we are having altered states of consciousness through the style of breath work and different things. Um, sound healing at the end of a five day fast, you know, like you are mm, people, if you haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've been getting Paul Hibbert out who <gasps> is the coach. He was Violana's coach and Tina Rodriguez's coach. I remember looking him up and I was going to go do some work with him because I, again, another contact from you, Mary Margrave had talked to me and um, said, you're um, now I'm blanking. I'm descended from the same uh, authors. Yes. <laughs> as, as uh, Hubbard. She's like, I think he's in Austin. I'm like, all right, I got to look him up. And then we had connected and then life got in the way and I'm sure I'll circle back with him, but he's a total gangster, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He's, we've had him twice at a full temple reset, which is a we're running immersives now, which are smaller groups. Uh, immersives are still wide open for people. If you look at fitforservice.com, you can see what's coming up. What's an immersive look like just so they can say, Immersive okay. might be, might be 30 people. It might be a hundred people, but it's strictly focused on one idea or one topic for the most part. Three days, four days, five days, two days, two days. Uh, mine's five. I don't think any of the other ones are five for full temple reset. And that's because we're doing a fasting mimicking diet for five days. We feast at the end, that's sound healing, all these other things. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a way to deep dive a particular topic. You know, we have another relationships, one that's coming up and Ob, Ob obviously knows that he's, hey, he's lived, he's lived the good, the bad and the ugly through relationships. Right. Uh, <laughs> but he also brings in a lot of experts, male and female that really know what the fuck they're doing on dating, on how to make marriages last, all these cool things. And uh, I think they're going to go to New York or LA for that this year. Uh, we had it the last time at the farm, but there's, there's things like that where it might be, you know, 50 people, it might be 30 people, it might be a hundred people, but it's a really tight knit group. That's just meeting for the first time to really deep dive a particular topic. And that's been an excellent thing because I've been, you know, I've been talking to people about fasting and hot and cold and all these things for, for years now. And to get to experience that with one another is a whole different ball game, especially when you're getting in the sun on the ice bath fasted, that changes it. Doing mobility fasted, doing all of these things just potentiates and unlocks the body in a way where I hadn't really experienced that before because I've done all these things, but not together at the same time. Yeah. And that was the yeah. little nod that I got, you know, the intuition when I was in Sedona um, was that if we combine all these, something special is going to happen. And uh, I remember Godzi asking me, he's like, dude, can I come be a part of that? I'm like, absolutely, man. You're my brother. And uh, he had just released his journaling course online. And I was like, maybe you can teach people for an hour a day on journaling because habit change is a big piece of this. And you and I are both along the same lines around habit change, both heavily influenced by James Clear and Atomic Habits. And so a lot of the stuff we're teaching is, is founded in those principles. So they don't just have a great time and fucking leave and go back to square one, that they actually take these things with them, having had a leg up with a five-day jump start, and then they can continue those practices going forward. So cool how that comes together though. Just phenomenal, right? He right? just wants to do it because it sounds cool. And then, then you're like, well, this would be, be And then all of a sudden it's just upgraded. Yeah. And he too wanted to, he wanted to, um, wanted to teach dream analysis for the first time. He had been doing it for friends for years. And uh, Jung, you know, is, is his God with a little G for, for his whole life. So to be able to do that has been something really special for him and for, you know, people in the space. As it turns out, like learning how to work with symbology is really important. It's important and you're in a visionary state from plant medicine or breath work or whatever. How do I break that down? What is my psyche trying to tell me? And that by far and away has been like one of the coolest things that people get when they come to this, you know, like, you know, you're not going to eat, you know, some other things are going to happen, but, but ultimately um, it's the shit you're not looking out for that, that it can have the greatest impact. And I'm glued to him every time he does this talk, you know, three of these we've done. And it's just like, I can't, I'm fucking pumped for it. God, I've um, got to drop in for that because uh, anytime yeah, you want brother, anytime yeah, you want. Absolutely. That, that's right up my alley. We're, we are going to, we're planning dates now, but we're going to run a second one this year. Uh, we ran two last year. Thought about only doing one and then, you know, sold out. I was like, all right, let's, let's do it again. You know, we'll give it proper marketing and make sure that there's eyes and ears on it. And we get it on their sellout. 30 people cap, you know, like people really get to know each other. And Sign really me up. Dive I'm deep. so yeah. in. Yeah. Hell yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot there where it's, it's, it, you know, even with the introduction of immersives, that's only been since last year, you know? So there's a lot of things where, 
Um, there's still novel experience in it for me. There's still ways where I get to, to kind of determine my own destiny. I mean, one of the things that's been great is from the jump, I decide what I want to talk about. Right? Like Bob's the boss and he is my boss, but at the same time, he's one of my closest friends and he's not determining for me what I need to talk about or which way I want to take the group. He trusts fully that whatever I need to teach them is something they need to know. And with that, I can really dive into to some of the new things that I'm really alchemizing and diving into. And, and that's been just incredible. And all of us have been on the deep dive with Mark Gaffney's work. I'm sure you've, you've heard of him. And I actually hadn't heard of him. No shit. Yes. Well, I'll tell you right now for your, your listeners will love it. Uh, he has several books. The best, in my opinion, is a lecture he did called The Erotic and the Holy. It's only on Audible. What's cool is it's a lecture. So he's laughing and cracking jokes, kind of like Ron Dust to come nobody. Me about this. I have that downloaded. It is mind blowing. I've listened to it three times. Um, I'm sure I'm not done with it yet, but it will be another one that I keep continuing to circle back on. He talks about first principles. What are the first principles of cosmos? Like, cause we in the state that we're in and in the divisive world that we live in, what are the things that we know to be true, true with a capital T that we can all agree on if we understand them, right? So we have to build this, this foundation of which we can stand on. And then as we move through, uh, role mate, which is I go to work. She, she, uh, does the laundry and watches the kids, like whatever role mate was Shit. into soulmate, which is tra- transcends and or transcends and include, right? You still have the, your part that you contribute with, but you, you transcend that and include it when you move to soulmate. And then you move from soulmate into whole mate. And whole mate is where both of you, and this can be any relationship, not just the love that you have, uh, shares the you share the same horizon what you're looking at together as you envision the world and the seeds that you're planting going forward is from the same view of the of the horizon of what's coming next and there couldn't be a more important thing to agree upon you know with all the the shit in the world like can we understand these first principles and heal what needs to be healed forgive what needs to be forgiven and come to a place where we share a similar outlook on the best way to go forward. That may never fucking happen, but if enough of us can do this, that can be enough to affect what world we're building now. You know, because the, as I had Michael Mead on who wrote um, Why the World Doesn't End, and it was pure medicine for me, you know, going through the last few years. And he had written it actually long before in 2012, but I had it fell into my lap, you know, right in the time of shit hitting mm. the fan. And he talked about this this ever unraveling, ever destruction of the earth that's matched and mirrored by the rebuilding of the new one, you know, and then following these, these fourth turning, these 80 year cycles, like what does the next high look like? You know, does the great reset happen or does the great awakening happen? And it's, you don't need to put it in black and white terms like that, but like, that's kind of what we're looking at, you know? And we, we don't know what the great reset would look like in actuality. Maybe Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates have a good idea. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. And we also don't know what the great awakening looks like. We don't, we can't for, foresee what the next high is going to be. But if we share that same, that same horizon and we share the best practices on how to go forward. Right. So it's not, it's not bankrupt all these farmers because they were spraying, spraying nitrates into the ground and nitrogen. Like, no, you don't bankrupt those guys and take them away. Maybe we teach them regenerative agriculture and, and they use less inputs. You can't force people to use organic inputs bankrupt them and then buy their farms for pennies on the dollar and pretend that you're doing something good. You're not right. Mm -hmm. Second largest food producer in the world, Netherlands. So there's, there's decisions like that that go a certain way. And then there's other decisions through education and, and really understanding the truth about what is the best form of agriculture? How do we, what is the most sustainable thing that we do? And then from there going forward with that, right. I think the, the clearer and clearer we get on the science behind certain things the easier it then becomes to say, this is something I want to do and I'm going to jump in there, you know? And, and as uh, many of the greats have said, like there's too much in the world to, f- to fix it all. Mm. Don't worry about that. Find the thing that you're drawn to. And that's all Gaffney shit. Allurement is what brought us together. Yeah. Right. Desire. There's something there, right? Eros is, is this, this feminine drive of attraction where you're like, this is, the, this is what I want to fucking do. And it feels good to do it. You know, and that, that, that's not the same as like, I want to snort some blow on the weekend. That's not Eros, right? That's pseudo Eros. Um, 
Eros leaves you more whole than when you started. Mm. Flow doesn't, right? So like mm. if I'm really tracking that and I'm following where my heart's sending me, we can accomplish amazing things and it doesn't have to fix. You know, I don't have to be the guy that fixes the ocean. I don't have to be the guy that fixes the atmosphere. I can just find my own little thing. I can fix food in my own way on a small scale. And other people can jump in on that. Um, you know, it might be Resvania that fixes social media, right? It might yeah. be a lot of these things that just find their way through their own niche based on what their desire is and what their wheelhouse is. And I think, you know, there's a lot of hope and optimism that I have there. Dillard's a guy who's got a lot of hope for technology and he's been great. We had him on my podcast recently and I love his outlook because he's a prepper in every sense of the word. And at the same time, he's got a lot of faith in what we can do through technology. And it's really important to counterbalance some of the harder things to watch and understand with, with the hope of what's possible going forward as well. Yeah. And I, 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 Again, I'm not familiar with Armstrong's work, but what I loved about what you said is like, here are the issues and here's the way out. There's the hard part, you know, guys like us sit here and we're like, fuck, there's a lot going on. We see it all. It's kind of out in the open now, but then it's like, now what? Because there's so much, you know, everyone's I'm not saying they're pulling their strings, but there's such, there is a semi-coordinated effort you know, cause all their interests are aligned yeah, and they've got dirt on each other. And so it becomes this thing where it's like, okay, what do we do with that? And I'm interested to, to watch him with Dell. That'd be fascinating. Yeah. He's incredible. He invented, uh, some, some AI, um, fairly early on that tracked cycles and it tracked war cycles, economic cycles, and all sorts of cool shit. And in his predictive models was able to determine the 87 stock, stock crash well, well ahead of time. He was able to determine um, the uh, first Iraq war. He was able to determine anything that's, that's of, of actual global importance. He can determine that and it has never been wrong. And he ended up being imprisoned for seven years because he wouldn't turn it over to the U.S. government. They cover this in the, in the documentary or in Dell's, Dell's uh, video with him, but he, they wanted, they, he was like, look, I'll run whatever question you want whatever question you have. And they're like, no, we want the thing. And so he's like, I can't give that to you. I'm not going to give that to you. And they wanted the code basically. And then after seven fucking years of wrongful imprisonment, the guy gets out, machine's still up and running and still telling the truth. And the biggest reason they think that, that, that they wanted that exclusively was because it can predict the fall of nations. It can predict like big, big stuff. And so uh, I'm not going to give anything away, but it, it is fantastic and fascinating. Um, can tell you where the dollar's going and when it's going there can tell you a lot of things. And he just, he just tells it all. So yeah, it's, it's uh, to get my trading hat back on. <laughs> it's awesome, dude. It's awesome. Okay. I know you're running out of time uh, real quick, just so we've got the immersives right now. The, the, the year long is full. There may be some openings. What is the cadence of that look like? For instance, let's say, yeah, we do. So for core, we do three events a year. First one's out at the farm in Lockhart, which is awesome because people get to actually see everything and all the work that we're putting into it. Um, second one changes, but we like big sky country. So we're going to Montana this year in the summer. And then we always finish in the fall at Sedona, at Ops Ranch in Sedona, which is just pristine. Uh, 45 acres. The backdrop is a national forest and Bear Mountain. Yeah, it's, Bear it's, Mountain is the largest mountain range there. And, and obviously Bear Mountain's got some big medicine. Um, there is a wait list for people who want in. You can just sign up and fill out an application there, uh, fitforservice.com. And just check, check on whatever immersives are calling you. Like literally let desire be the thing. It's not like this is what I should do. Their buddy Ted Decker says, stop shooting on yourself. Yeah. There's no point in that. That's not sustainable. It's not, if you, if you should lose 20 pounds, good luck. Yeah. You know, if you yeah, fucking want that. it, you're going to lose it. Yeah. Um, so that authentic desire, uh, and we have really cool things. We're going to be doing our first, you know, real, prep course at the end of the year where we're just bringing in, you know, some, some Navy SEAL guys. Uh, my buddy was a Navy EOD and um, just going over basics, you know, like, like, and this is shit, you know, no matter what happens in the world, this is stuff you need. We, I started filling up my closet, my, my extra pantry called the apocalypse pantry um, in 2020 or late 2019 and snow apocalypse hit. And we had, I had eight people from this hunt that couldn't fly home. And so we filled our house. We had extra beds. We filled our house. It's a 2,400 square foot house. It's not a big house, but we all ate like kings, right? Because we had extra. 
you know, we had planned ahead. And, and as it turns out, that's a really smart thing to do. I still know friends just this year that lost power for a week and were sleeping at someone else's house or hadn't showered. And they were just like, fuck it. I feel too awkward to ask. And then, yeah. you know, they just suffer through it. Um, you can make it a lot better for yourself if you just, you know, put a little aside and it's not like I'm going crazy with some type of 30 year supply, you know, and all that jazz, but yeah, about 20 um, years. Yeah. Yeah. 20. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just thinking in those ways really, you know, especially as a dad, um, helps me to go to bed at night knowing like I've checked some boxes and if things get weird, I'm okay, you know, and they're going to be okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, that's probably, you know, uh, that's the first time we'll be doing that one. Um, a lot are focused on relationships. Uh, this, maybe not this year, but next we're going to start rolling out our first uh, parenting stuff where we're helping bring in some of the experts like Kim Jong Payne, who wrote Soul of Discipline, um, to, to really help parents navigate these waters, especially as they start, you know, to transform themselves you know, there can be a lot of guilt around doing things differently before kind of awakening to a different way. And that can be really hard for parents. It can also be really hard for kids where they're like, dad's different. What, I don't get it. You know, what's going on? Or mom's different. She likes different things and uh, she's eating differently or any of this, any of these things, right? How do we bridge that gap? And for teenagers, you know, how, what can we do uh, with someone like your boys? You know, what can we do with them? That's going to be age appropriate, but fucking awesome where it, it shifts their state of mind. It kind of breaks them out of the, the, the prison of high school and the, the repetitive thought patterns. It just snaps that so they can see with a greater and greater awareness. I mean, how do they integrate that with their parents who still may be you know, not doing the same shit and still into the same things that aren't exactly, you know, going to help them grow. Right? Well, so, you know, I wonder about that with, with my kids. It's almost like there has to be a, uh, I don't know if it's a de-education something or other. I mean, they're, they're going to, you know, high school and they're, they're going, they're doing the thing, but, and luckily my kids are aware enough with all the woke shit and they're, they are not down with it. So they're, they're very attuned to it. But they're still like, just like you said, that the repetitive, like it, it's how do we kind of, um, you know, really pull that out of them and get them to be able to express, you know, their creativity and, and what it is that really drives them versus going down this, this kind of path that is usually chosen by someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's something we're really excited about. And, you know, we've, we've had a lot of parents being like, when are you guys going to do that? I'm like, I'm the only fucking dad as a coach. Like yeah. <laughs> there's no draw here, but Aubrey's getting ready uh, to try for kids. Godzi and Caitlin as well. So um, shit's about to change, you know, and as we grow and learn and continue to change that affects what we're teaching and who we're bringing in. So I'm, I'm super excited about everything that we're continuing to do and the people we're bringing on. Uh, we will have Gaffney at the end of the year. So, you know, face to face in Sedona, I'm yeah. like, let's go. Yes. Um, possibly John Churchill. who was on Aubrey's podcast. He's, he's basically the Buddhist equivalent of Gaffney, Gaffney, what Gaffney is to um, the Kabbalah and uh, Jewish mysticism. He is to Eastern mysticism. So some pretty heavy hitters when it comes to like the, the living legend, spiritual game yeah, and, and everything in between, you know, um, Guy Senstock is going to be speaking at our first event who started a practice called circling. You can, you can Google that. Um, he's fantastic. Like his form of communication, like that's, he will, we will have him at the parent, parent kid ones because it's, it just is groundbreaking in his ability to peel off layers, to pull off the persona and the mask and actually witness somebody. And there's not a, there's, you know, like there's not a dry eye in the stands, you know, like fucking, <laughs> it will fucking crack you open. Um, and it's powerful. It's powerful to move energy like that and to be able to feel held and seen in that way, but also to fucking, to let the guard down and to feel all the feels. And, and you would never in a million years think that's going to happen from a guy talking about some circling. What is that? It's a communication. Th what, what? That's the level. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's such a amazing piece. So I'm stoked for it, man. It just keeps getting better and better. And do you guys offer any kind of discount codes or anything like that? Or is it just it's we, we don't have discount codes. Um, if financial issues are a thing, you know, and you have the greatest application of all time, we do, we do have scholarships. Okay. Where great. We bring people in. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, 
pretty cool. One of my homies, Amanda, who's uh, an amazing singer. Um, I sponsored her for Full Temple Reset and all of the staff fell in love with her and she's now sponsored for the whole year on yeah. scholarship. So That's it's pretty fuck, fucking yeah. cool. You know, she's just a great, great person. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, fill it out, see what it is and, and continue to check in on that because it's cool and, and the offerings change, you know. All right. So it's almost time for you to leave. Let's wrap with the tattoo. Tattoo. <laughs> How much time we got? Five minutes, 30 seconds? Well, we got as much time as you've got. It's, it's <laughs> one twenty nine. So I know you've got to... <laughs> Let me, let me just, let me just punch this in real quick. I'll tell you exactly how much time we have. You got to be there by when? Well, I was supposed to podcast at two, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quick one on the tattoo quick then. The tattoo. the tattoo is basically every animal that that's influenced me. I've got, I've got the honeybee on my hand uh, at an ecstatic dance in Sedona. I had a honeybee land on this hand and, and, and fucking just started. You know, I started tuning into it. Like Will Tegel talks, he has a whole book written about it called the mother tongue. It's an ancient language where uh, if we're tuned in and we can listen, we can actually communicate and come into communication with plants and animals and anything between. I wouldn't have been open to that until ayahuasca. And then it's like, of course, of course, yeah. it's true. And so knowing that when this bee landed, I started a conversation with it. And, and it was talking to me about the importance of the bees and, and thanking me for my love for nature. And it was, it was super touching to really feel that, the gratitude, you know, and um, maybe I'm making all that shit up in my head, but, but it was, as it's making me emotional right now, I was, I was just floored, like, holy shit. And, um, you know, 10 minutes went by and it's one of the reasons I wanted to get into farming. Like, I want to do it. You know, I want to have, we have our own bees. Like, I want to fucking buy the trees that and plant the trees that have the most flowers just for them. You know, I want to, I want to change the ego field just for them and uh, know that, you know, as Paul check says, they're the sex organs of the earth. Like they're what, there's what, there's what keeps reproduction alive. And um, you know, it stayed with me for about 10 minutes and then I was like, I got to keep dancing. So I went back, P was playing and it stayed on my hand for fucking 20 more minutes while I was dancing. I'm moving around, I'm dancing weird. It's just staying right there with me. And people were like, Whoa, dude, you got it. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's cool. <laughs> like it was just, it was, it was a big deal. And, um, so that, that's, that's continued to be a medicine teacher for me. Um, have you seen Avatar too? I haven't. Ah, oh, shit. All right. Well, I, without giving any away, well, you can give it I'll away. give something away. Sigourney Weaver has a kid who's at one of the features and she has this innate ability to be tapped in to Awa. She's, she's got it right. There's a, there's a beautiful communication that she has with her. And I was talk, chatting with Ta, uh, Tasha about it, my wife, after, and, you know, she's like, if you could have any, any of this or that, you know, what would it be? And we're always talking like with the kids around superpowers. And I was like, if I could have fucking any superpower, it'd be hers. Like it would, it would really like to be that tapped in and that connected. And right as, uh, right as we get to the door, I started thinking about that. And this bee flies right in front. Oh, <laughs> I no like, way. I was like, man. And I, I open the door and the door's open and, and I'm talking to the bee. I'm like, no, no, don't go in, buddy. Don't go in. Stay out here. You know, stay out here. Don't go in. And then it, it dawns on me right there. That's the God nod. Like, I got that. I got that from fucking everything on my arm and chest. You know, I have that already. And uh, it's just a matter of like softening to a place where I can actually receive that. You know, where I can receive like the, the, the God nod. The head, the head, the the little head of approval and, and the confirmation on the big things, those synchronicities, you know, I was, uh, I'll wrap with one more. I was on the farm and, you know, doing sacred hunts with Monsal Denton. We always do a tobacco prayer where we, we pray to the apex predator of the land and in Texas, that's going to be the rattlesnake or, um, the mountain lion. And so we always make this prayer to both of them asking for permission to hunt on the land and then for their guidance. And uh, permission has been a big one that I've learned from indigenous cultures, like really honoring, to honor and respect, you always leave something, but also ask first, like see if there's a yes. And what does that yes feel like? It feels like an opening. A no is a closing. It's constrictive, right? And so, yes, we always get the yes to hunt, but um, that permission is always asked. And <laughs> it dawned on me that I hadn't asked to be caretaker of the land in Lockhart. I just assumed the position. 
And so all my kids are out on stand up paddle boards and, and Eric's out there and Christian's out there and all the kids are getting watched. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm going to run to the side here. Cause I don't have time to meditate. And last time I tried to meditate out there, I just got swarmed by mosquitoes cause it was sunset. So I'm like, it's midday in the summer. I should be good here. And they're like, go for it, dude. Have your quiet time. So I swim off to the side and I'm sitting, you know, like I am now my ass is underwater, but my knees are above the water. And I close my eyes and I start, you know, thanking the sun for being so hot that I don't have to deal with any fucking mosquitoes <laughs> and, and that it's quiet. And all I hear are the birds and the breeze blowing and uh, thanking the water for keeping me cool in the hot sun. And then I hear in my right ear, and I'm like, fuck, man, you got to be kidding me. So I open my eye and it's this weird looking thing. I still don't know what it is. It was like a bee mixed with a yellow jacket. I was like, oh shit. And I'd never seen it before. So I was like, are you, you going to fuck with me? Are you going to, you're going to sting me? And I was like, ah, like, not if I'm cool. You know, am I cool? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm cool. Are you cool? Yeah, you're cool. If I'm cool. And the second I come to that realization, it lands on my left knee. And there's no fear of being stung because I had, I had recentered myself, you know, from meditating prior and just being right there with it. I was like, interesting, cool. Go back in, mantra, 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 eyes closed. And my eyes feel like they're pried open to the left, not a single sound. And I just look left from the meditation, like something's in my field. And a cotton mouth, a water moccasin is swimming <laughs> right towards me with both eyes locked on my eyes, <clears throat> both eyes deadlocked on my eyes. And I was like, whoa. Uh, am I cool? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm cool. Are you cool? Yep. You're cool if I'm cool. Doesn't break eye contact, swims around my left knee and puts its head on my right knee. Eye to eye. Fuck. For like, I don't know, three minutes. It felt like eternity. It might've been an earthquake. It only lasted 15 seconds, but I was just like, holy shit. Fuck. And I basically came to terms, like, if I get bit, I get bit, but I'm not budging. I'm going to sit here with you. And when I did that, I felt my, my field and I felt its field. And I knew there was communication going on. And the first thing that popped into my mind was being caretaker of the land and not having asked that prayer you know, for, the, for the permission. And so I was staring at it. I was like, oh, shit. Oh, that's it. And I was like, oh, fuck, man. I'm sorry. Uh, is it cool? You know? And, and then that was the, yeah, it's cool. Thank you for being here. You know, like honor everything, honor the cotton mouth, honor all of it. And that's the promise. So I got this snake wrapped all the way around my kids, wolf and bear and my wife, the snow leopard. There's obviously quite a few mushrooms here. There's some eye leaves and dragonfly, which is another one we didn't get into, but yeah, everything on the arm has deep meaning to me. And, um, you know, there's room for another sleeve of spirit animals to come in and sure. continue to guide me. So that's, that's, uh, that's was the, the point in waiting till I was 40, I guess, to get all this work done. But yeah, brother. Beautiful. I'm so glad you shared that. You shared that story with me when we were together. And I was, I was thinking about, it. I was like, I really, I'm like, shoot, I, I, you know, do I do the tattoo after I'd asked for the tattoo? I'm like, oh, I really wanted to hear that story about the cotton mouth. And then you shared it. So. Oh, brother. Well, thanks for fe feeding me through the Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> well, you got to roll, dude. This has been special. It always is. Thanks for being here. I love you. I love you big time, brother. Thanks for having me. Yeah.